have a long episode for you today, a compilation of the best of dread. But before we get to the stories, I want to thank our sponsor Morgan and Morgan. When selecting an injury law firm, size matters. Let me introduce you to Morgan and Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. Boasting over 100 offices nationwide and a robust team of 900 lawyers, and growing, they possess the resources necessary to secure the best possible outcomes for their clients. With the capacity to invest millions in a case, Morgan & Morgan is well equipped to handle a diverse range of personal injury cases, including car accidents, slip and fall incidents, workplace injuries, medical malpractice, nursing home abuse, and defective product claims. Unlike firms that operate on a one-lawyer-fits-all model, Morgan & Morgan has attorneys who specialize in every area of personal injury law. This specialization ensures that you'll be matched with a lawyer who has a deep understanding of the specific legal landscape relevant to your case. Moreover, Morgan & Morgan operates on a contingency fee basis, meaning you won't incur any charges unless they win your case. There are no upfront costs, sign-up fees, or charges for calls, investigations, meetings, or the time and effort dedicated to your case. This client-centric approach has led to a remarkable recovery of over $13 billion for their clients. With a trust base of over 3 million people, many choose to call Morgan & Morgan in their time of need. Their impressive support infrastructure includes over 4,000 staff members available 24-7 to address your case questions or concerns. Initiating the process is straightforward. Click the link in my description, visit fourthpeople.com slash Donovan, or dial pound law from your cell phone. And don't forget to mention Donovan sent you. This ordeal happened on an evening shift I spent working at Guadalupe Mountains National Park. It's located in the great state of Texas, west of Carlsbad Cavern if you're looking to place it on a map. I'm a park ranger there. It's a pretty good gig, I've got to admit. No two days are ever the same out there. Plus, I don't have to be stuck behind some clammy office desk all day. I wouldn't survive doing that, I'm sure of it. However, the day I want to talk to you about was not something I ever expected to encounter out there. It began pretty ordinary at first, I just started my shift in the later afternoon. I arrived at the main office. I put on my uniform, sprayed on some bug spray, laced up my boots and got my gear loaded into the truck. As a ranger, my responsibilities may be many, but the core of it is always human and nature interaction. We look out for wildlife, making sure they're keeping to themselves and not getting too friendly with visitors. We maintain the trail system, handle any erosion in the trafficked areas, not to mention dealing with all the campers who think it's a good idea to feed the animals. So there I was, cruising through in my truck, checking on my zone like it was any other day. The air had that nice chill, the type that goes right through your clothes if you aren't wearing proper layers. The graying light was gently turning the mountains a lavender hue, like some artist took a brush to them. This is why I like the evening shift. I decided to make a stop at a remote picnic area called Pine Springs. I needed to reset a few trail signs and make sure things were as they should be. I parked the truck, got out, and stretched, enjoying the quiet that was to be found at that time of day. I had the spare signpost in one hand and hardware in the other. As I was working on fixing the sign, a strange feeling washed over me. You know that sensation where you suddenly feel like you're not alone? It was like that. It felt colder and emptier than any normal evening breeze. I halted, screwdriver in hand, and looked around, partly expecting to see a coyote out of its den or some other woodland creature. But it was just me. At least that's what I thought. After double-checking my surroundings, I told myself that it was probably a play of wind currents or just late-night jitters. I rolled my eyes at my overactive imagination and finished up the post-adjustment but something deep inside was warning me. This wasn't just another shift. There was something strange going on here. Then, out of nowhere, a loud buzzing hit my ears. It felt like thousands of bees. It was like I had stuck my head in a hornet's nest. I shook my head and double-checked my surroundings once more. Was it another vehicle? 
a plane, nothing. With all these strange happenings, my heart was pounding in my chest. I knew something wasn't right here and quickly radioed the ranger station. But I couldn't get through and so there was no response. Just that incessant humming noise. I tried my cell and even that was acting up. It was like all electronic devices decided to go on a strike. Just as I was turning to hop in my truck, something caught my eye. There, right above the grove of trees, was this thing. I don't even know how to describe it. It looked smooth and round, almost spherical, but not perfectly so, and it was almost undetectable with my eyes. But the humming sound gave it away. From the distance I was at, I'd say it was only a few feet across, and entirely metallic. I appeared to be glowing softly, casting an eerie light down onto the pine trees below. It just hovered there. I felt this inexplicable shudder run down my spine. Then it moved like nothing I've ever seen. It was quick and sharp. One moment it was over the trees, and the next, it was swooping low, right over my head. Once it passed, the humming dulled down, and then it was gone as if it was never even there. I was left standing there, my heart pounding like a jackhammer, just staring at the night sky, the only lights being the distant stars and my truck's headlights. The rest of the night was a blur. I remember getting back in my truck and making it back to the ranger station, not daring to glance at my rearview mirror. I spent the rest of the night wide awake, pondering the bizarre events. What was that thing? Where did it go? And why here, in a remote national park of all places? Come morning, I looked for any evidence of that strange encounter. My tire tracks were still there, and so were my scattered tools by the signpost but no sign of any metallic object or unusual tracks anywhere. It was as if it had never happened. You might think I dreamed it all up, but I know what I saw, and I know that it was real. As for my thoughts on that encounter, I don't know what to think anymore. I've been a park ranger for about 20 years now operating mostly around Utah's Goblin Valley State Park. I've come across some odd folks and had a few close encounters with wildlife over the years, but nothing I'd ever considered unnatural. But that changed soon enough. The first report started trickling in sometime around late May, if my memory serves. Folks in the park said they heard strange clicking noises during the night. They all had the same story, and all of them said the clicking sounded displaced, like it was metallic in nature, and coming from all directions at once. Definitely not something you would expect to hear in the woods. Being the main and pretty much only ranger in these parts, it was my responsibility to check things out. Plus, the last thing I needed was some city slickers running around in a panic, claiming we got some strange creature living in our caves. That day began as usual. Rig checked, radio tuned into the local station, coffee in the thermos. I swung by the welcome center to make sure all was in order there, and then began my patrol route with the reports in mind. The first few hours were unremarkable. I checked out the camping sites, offered advice to a couple of rookie campers on bear safety, and helped in a tense moment of a family trying to locate their wandering child. But honestly, it was just another day in the life. During my lunch break, under the bright and unrelenting Utah sun, I chose one of the more remote trails to check out. It was an area several of our visitors had made reports from. I parked my rig in the shadow of the towering sandstone formations and munched on my sad excuse for a sandwich for a minute before heading out. The sound of the wind rustling the distant brush was the only thing that interrupted the desert silence. I hiked around for a little bit, really just wandering without any real direction, hoping to catch wind of the reported clicking. If I heard it, I figured I'd find a reasonable explanation for it soon enough. Maybe a trail signpost had come loose and was banging in the wind. That's usually how it goes. We get strange reports from time to time, and upon investigation, it's always something mundane because there is always a logical explanation. But then, as I neared a shallow ravine, the air just changed. Have you ever walked into a room and immediately knew you were unwelcome? It was exactly like that. But this was my park, and I wasn't going to be spooked out this easy. So, I'm standing there by the ravine, feeling this sense of dread creeping up when I hear it. 
It was definitely the clicking sound. It was a dizzying sequence of clicks and chitters, precisely echoing the descriptions of it in the reports. I have to admit I was a little uneasy at this point. I noted the direction of the sound and cautiously moved towards it. Turning a bend, I saw something move, a quick flash of something moving incredibly fast and utterly silent. I could only make out a vague shape, pale, somewhat human-like, and crawling on all fours. My heart pounded in my chest. You know those moments when it feels like you've stumbled into something you shouldn't have. But there I was, straining my eyes in the broad daylight, trying to wrap my head around what I had just seen. Was it a ghost? Some type of ghoul? A demon? The logical part of me thought maybe it was just some sick person, pale and emaciated, who was plagued with some mental illness that brought them out into the wild in such a state. But deep down, I knew that was not the case. I hightailed it back to the truck, my brain buzzing in an adrenaline-fueled haze. I wanted to know what that thing was, but I didn't want to know bad enough to stick around. Back at the welcome center, I took a moment to collect my thoughts. I barely remember the drive home. There was nothing in my 20 years of experience that could have prepared me for such an occurrence. I didn't have answers, but I'm not even sure I wanted them at that point. Whatever that thing was, something deep in my senses just knew that it was dangerous. You know, all those stories of people going missing around national parks. I always thought it was just ill-prepared tourists that got caught in bad weather or unsuitable terrain. But now, I think maybe there is another reason, and I think you know what I'm talking about. I tried telling some of my colleagues in town about what I'd seen, but that went nowhere really fast. I just got strange looks or jokes tossed my way, but I'm sticking with my guns. My mind and my body both know what really happened. There's undoubtedly more to the wilderness than meets the eye. And we humans are crazy if we think we know everything about the universe that there is to know. Stay safe, everyone. So, this happened when I was working as a park ranger at the Congaree National Park in South Carolina. Congaree is a special place. It's a vast, swampy, old-growth forest that could make even the most seasoned outdoorsmen feel like they might just be wandering onto something magical and primal. I might just have the best office in the world, at least in my opinion. On this particular night, I was out patrolling. We had quite a few incidents involving fishermen breaking the rules that summer, either fishing without a license or taking more than the limit. We weren't sure why, but was something I had to keep an eye on. Mostly, the perpetrators thought they could get away with it at night, which is why we had increased nighttime patrols. So there I was, working the night shift in Congaree. Nighttime in the park is something else. Owls hooting, coyotes howling in the distance, lots of activity as the forest's peculiar nightlife awaken, a symphony of peeper frogs singing in the swamp. I loved it, but I could see how it might seem spooky from time to time. It was basically the soundtrack of a horror film, if you thought about it that way. That night I was making my way around the Cedar Creek path. The moon was just a faint glimmer behind the clouds, providing just enough light that I didn't have to use a flashlight just yet. Something gave me pause, though, a feeling like I wasn't alone. I've spent enough nights in the woods to know when something's not right. At first, I brushed it off. It's the swamp, after all. A strange noise or an unexpected movement is all part of the package. However, this felt different. This one was a kind of silence that doesn't belong in a forest. I was nearing one of the older and less explored regions of the park when I noticed a stench that was distinctly different from the usual earthy, mossy smells you get used to in the wild. It was a sulfur-like smell. Now, here's where things started getting weird. I picked up a bizarre figure around five feet tall moving through the tall, sharp-edged sawgrass. I couldn't make it out clearly, but it moved swiftly on legs that were oddly angled, like they were hawked. There was something unnerving about it, but I couldn't see it clearly enough to figure out what. The silhouette looked almost like a deer. It appeared almost skeletal with a weird outer contour. I thought maybe it was just a distressed animal, tangled up in something but then I noticed its shape more clearly. It was like some nightmarish cross between regions of the animal kingdom 
that aren't supposed to meet. Too big for a coyote, too strange for a bear, and definitely not any herpetological creature I can reckon. The alarms in my head were going off, but still I followed. There was a dreadful fascination about it. I had to know what it was. I moved towards the creature. The cracked twigs and disturbed underbrush indicated I was not the first to pass through this way that night. I turned a corner around a thicket of palmettos, my flashlight gripping the sweeping branches, and then I saw it. It wasn't an animal, nor a person. It was a thing, some sort of alien creature, a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. From where I stood, it seemed almost five feet, maybe six including those bizarre protuberances which at first I took for branches stuck into matted fur, but which later I realized, to a growing horror, were, in fact, wings. They were the kind you see on bats or similar critters. No feathers, just webbed membranes stretched across its limbs. I was too fixated on the creature to worry about my safety. It was beyond belief. The head of this monstrosity was elongated like a horse's head, but the features seemed to be constantly twisting, like it might be some kind of shapeshifter. I remember its eyes were yellow and glowing against the shine of my flashlight. The creature just stood there staring at me. It seemed inquisitive almost. I stared back at it in a state of sheer confusion and terror. I watched as its long black tongue slithered from its mouth and tracing the contours of its face. It licked at the air as if it were trying to use its tongue to smell like a snake. Parts of its body had hair like a deer while others looked like it was sheathed in some kind of tight, scaly skin that shimmered in the light of my flashlight. I stumbled back, my heart tripping over its beats, my mind screaming at me to run, but I stood my ground. I have no idea what possessed me to do so. With a final glance at me, the creature spread its grotesque wings wide. An uncanny, ear-splitting shriek filled the air as it took flight and disappeared into the darkness. I rushed back to the station senseless with what I'd seen. I tried to put my thoughts down into words, to rationalize it, but it was useless. I had encountered a creature something straight out of a horror novel. In the days that followed, I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder during my rounds, half anticipating and half dreading another encounter. The once familiar grounds of the Congaree National Park took on a sinister form. I didn't enjoy working the night shift anymore. I avoided it if at all possible, and the nights I did have to work, I stayed in my truck. Whether you believe my tale or not, I hope you heed caution if you ever decide to take a visit to Congaree National Park. It's a beautiful place, but I wouldn't go there after dark if I were you. The woods hold secrets beyond our understanding, so all I can say is always watch your back. A few years back, I was working as a park ranger at Tallulah Gorge State Park in Georgia. If you haven't heard of it, it's one of the most stunning landscapes you could ever encounter. Towering cliffs, an expansive river, and beautiful tall tree. But let me tell you, as gorgeous as it is during the day, there's an eeriness that descends when the night hits. I've been a fan of solitude all my life. It was one of the reasons why I chose this profession. My daily routine mostly consisted of patrolling the park, keeping an eye on any unauthorized shenanigans, making sure the visitors were safe, and maintaining the ecosystem. On this particular night, I was out on one of my usual patrols. The moon was a sliver, barely providing any light. Prime time for some of those nocturnal animals to be out and about while the human world slept. Basically, everything was as usual that night. There were a couple of owls hooting in the distance, the rustle of leaves in the wind, and silence. I was midway through my patrol when I heard it, a low but distinct growl. I almost felt it more than I heard it, and I knew instantly that this was different from any species of animal I had ever heard. It was deeper, and it sounded predatory. I paused, the sound driving me to stillness. Next, I picked up a dreadful stench like in an old dank basement but worse. It was moldy with a hint of something rotten. It was a revolting smell, and enough to make my stomach twist. Following my training, I started backing away slowly, thinking I had just stumbled upon an animal carcass that was likely being guarded by some hungry predator. 
My heart pounded in my chest. I had a white knuckled grip on my flashlight. I kept my ears open, every creak and rustle amplifying my anxiety. The last thing I remember before rushing back to the cabin was the sight of two gleaming yellow eyes glowing in the pitch dark from amongst the trees. The eyes had a deep set fierceness, a hunter's glare, that was unnerving to say the least. The sight of them was enough to drain the blood from my face. I escaped that night and found the safety of my truck, but I wasn't done yet. I wanted to know what that creature was, even thought I knew the part would not condone me chasing after it. So anyway, the next night I came prepared. I had my old shotgun from my hunting days, loaded with buckshot, and a high-powered flashlight strapped to my chest. This wasn't some old bear I was dealing with. The growl, the eyes I saw, and that disgusting smell all hinted at something far from normal. I knew that I needed all the protection I could get. I reached the spot. My stomach twisted in all sorts of knots, knowing something was out there. It wasn't long before it appeared. At first, it was just a silhouette against the dark backdrop of the woods. Something massive, with broad shoulders and chunky arms, seven feet tall at least. My flashlight found it in the dark, and the beam fell on its face, and I wish it hadn't. The face I saw in the beam of my flashlight wasn't one I recognized from any animal in the park. It had a long, pronounced muzzle, with thick whiskers and a brow ridge that almost completely shadowed the deep-set, glowing yellow eyes. The face was distinctly canine, but the body resembled a human. I saw rows of jagged teeth as its snarling lips curled up in a growl that echoed around the otherwise silent woods. The body was beastly with robust dog-like legs, a hunched back, and completely covered in fur. This was straight out of a horror movie. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. That rank, putrid smell filled the air again. It was more pungent now, and so bad I could taste it. I remember the shrill of crickets abruptly halting, as a deep rumble echoed through the still night, followed by a deafening howl that seemed to shake the very ground I stood on. My instincts took over, and before I knew what I was doing, my finger had squeezed the trigger. The creature let out an aggressive grunt and shot off into the dark wilderness, at a speed that seemed impossible for any normal creature of that size. I didn't chase it or try to find where it went. I was too shaken, still working to slow down my hammering heart, and wondering if the monster would leap out from the dark woods at any moment. In the days that followed, I kept a low profile, avoiding my usual patrol routes, especially the spot where I encountered the creature. I couldn't shake off the feeling of those piercing yellow eyes watching me from the trees. I had hit the creature, but I expected it was still alive out there, and I didn't want to see it again. I'm sure it would remember me, and I might not be so lucky next time. This happened on one early morning shift at Cape Henlopen State Park, Delaware. And, just to set the scene for you, my day as a ranger usually starts pretty early, basically at the crack of dawn. Now Cape Henlopen is my stomping ground, has been since I started working here. Mornings in the park have their own special charm as you get to know the spaces and the creatures the best at this time. On this particular day, my tasks weren't any different than usual. After a brief stop at the station to grab a cup of coffee, I headed out on patrol. Just before noon, I received a call about a curious raccoon who found himself trapped in a bear-proof trash can. That was the extent of my excitement at that point. With the raccoon rescued, I went on about with the rest of the mundane tasks on my list. It wasn't until after lunch that my day really got interesting. I got a call from the office about some strange noise complaints from the beach area. Now ordinarily, noise complaints aren't really our department, but it was a slow day and we had sent some people home. Also, truth be told, I was eager for a bit of a change. The beach was a short ride from where I was, so I hopped on the quad and headed off. It didn't take long to get there. I stopped the quad a bit away from the reported area and continued on foot, hoping to be able to hear better and figure out what was causing the commotion. As I walked along the shoreline, trying to pinpoint the source of the noise. I started to feel weird, like it was harder to breath and the air was heavier than normal. Now I've been in the wild long enough to know that when you get that kind of feeling, you pay attention to it. 
It wasn't just the weather. Something else was different. Then I heard it. An uncanny, screech-like sound coming from further down the shoreline. So I faced that direction and started walking. As I got closer to the sound, it became more defined. Like an animal screech. Only it sounded like it was echoing. Like it was coming from somewhere deeper. Almost like it was resonating from a crevice or cave or something. Near where the noise was the strongest, I spotted something even stranger. There was this huge, indistinct print in the sand. This wasn't like any bird, mammal, or reptile that I'd ever seen in my years on the job. It looked, well, alien. Curiosity won over and I followed the eerie noise in the prints, feeling the hair raising on the back of my neck all the while. The deeper I ventured into the dunes, the more I felt like I wasn't alone. Have you ever had that feeling? Like something's watching you and you just can't shake it off? It was like that. So, I slowly turned around to try and find the source and that's when I spotted it. This big shadowy figure, partially obscured by a dune. It was nearly five and a half feet tall with a broad, almost human body. But its most prominent feature was this insane set of wings. They were large, refracting sunlight like black leather. I couldn't make out the details of its face though. It was cloaked in darkness except for two reflective red eyes that met mine. I was paralyzed. I could feel its eyes fixed on me. It was calculating, intelligent, and for a split second I questioned my place in the natural order. I definitely did not feel powerful at that moment. In the blur of an instant, the creature let out that horrific screech again, revealing its gaping, faceless visage, and then, as quick and soundless as the wind, it disappeared. It seemed to glide rather than fly, disappearing between the dunes leaving me alone on that desolate beach. I was quick to recover my senses. I marked the exact location and the sign in the sand of the creature's presence. And then, against every instinct screaming to investigate further, I ran. I ran towards the quad and sped away from the beach. The days following the incident were anything but normal. They were filled with restless nights and numerous questions that led to dead ends. I told my co-workers about my encounter in hopes that they could tell me what it was. But, not surprisingly, no one believed me. But then I did a little research of my own. I am now certain it was the Mothman I saw that day on the beach. There are no other creatures matching the description online. But I don't feel I can tell anyone about my findings for fear of being labeled as crazy. I already had to deal with my co-workers poking fun at me for weeks when I first mentioned it. But know this, there are things out there that might sound like they only exist in myth and legends. But, I'm here to tell you that they just might be real. I've got an eerie incident to tell you about that happened during one of my night shifts as a security guard in an industrial factory. I still can't make much sense of it. It wasn't any special or classified factory or anything. Nothing strange about it, at least not at first. It was in the business suburbs of Dayton, Ohio. Most of my nights were spent sitting alone and staring at monitors. I would do patrols of the building on foot, but I never caught up with or saw anything out of the ordinary. Every once in a while, someone forgot to lock their office door, but that was about it. No big deal. The factory manufactured car parts for various auto companies. My shift started at 10 p.m. and ended at 6 a.m and my primary duty was to keep the property and its assets safe from external threats. There weren't many people out there looking to steal factory-made car parts, so my main adversaries were time and boredom. Every hour, I'd do security checks, a full sweep of the premises, the factory floor, the administrative offices, the warehouses. Every corner was covered during those rounds. Those strolls were the only exercise I got all night, and they actually helped to keep me awake. The more significant part of the job, though, was keeping an eye on the surveillance footage. A whole series of monitors scanned and recorded any movement on the factory grounds, both inside or out. The video feeds were black and white, grainy like old film. Management didn't want to spend the money for a new system, so we were stuck with this. It wasn't perfect, but it worked good enough for the bosses, so I was okay with it too. One particular Friday night, more accurately, very early Saturday morning, 
I was going through my usual routine. I finished my midnight rounds and returned to my security hub. It was then when I first noticed something unusual. I was gazing at the monitor showing footage from the storage area when I spotted a flicker of movement. At first, I brushed it off as a poor quality in the system, but then it happened again. On the screen, a slightly darker shadow hovered at the corner. Now mind you, at that hour in the dead silence, even the smallest abnormality feels amplified. But this, this was feeling like my own personal Twilight Zone episode. This shadow seemed to move independently. Its edges were blurry. I would describe it as looking closer to a patch of dense fog than a definite silhouette. Yet, for it to appear in the middle of a dry, well-maintained room seemed improbable, if not impossible. It hovered, swaying gently in one corner of the storage area. At one point, it seemed to take the form of a human, but I couldn't properly tell. The footage quality wasn't great. Part of me wanted this to be a dusty camera revealing rat or a raccoon. But deep down, I was afraid. I tried to brush off my unease. Taking a deep breath, I decided to go and check on the moving shadow. I don't know if this would be better or worse than confronting a living intruder. I didn't know how it would react when I showed up. But part of me was convinced that this couldn't be real, that I was letting my imagination get the better of me. So, armed with just my flashlight and an old sturdy wrench, I ventured into the cold, silent factory halls. My heart was pounding in my ears. As I neared the storage area, the air changed. The usual musty smell was replaced with a faint scent of roses. I paused, completely baffled by the situation. I felt a chill run down my spine. Something was undoubtedly not right here. I cautiously opened the storeroom door and shone my flashlight directly at the corner, where I'd seen the anomaly. The beam seemed to almost stick to the strange, foggy figure instead of passing through. I gasped as the shadow slowly turned to face me. Distorted yet discernible features were visible. It had these piercingly bright hollow eyes, glowing white in the murky room. As my gaze locked with those glowing eyes, I could feel a jolt of sadness, a silent plea hauntingly coming from the ethereal figure. There was a strange air about the figure, but it wasn't the danger or malice that I previously thought. The figure's apparent sorrow made my stomach churn. I dropped the wrench. The loud clang of it echoed around the room. And then, in less than a blink, the ghostly figure vanished. It was like it was never even there, except for the very faint scent of roses that hung in the air. I bolted out of the room and back to the safety of my small security hut. I replayed the surveillance footage. It captured everything, even the moment that the figure disappeared into thin air. I sat there in disbelief, trying to come to terms with what just happened. I managed to see the rest of the shift through. I reported to my replacement guard at 6 a.m. He brushed off my shaken expressions as a joke, but before I left, I told him to take a look at the security footage if he didn't believe me. There wasn't any more joking after that. I've kept an eye out for the strange figure on the monitors, but I haven't seen anything since that night. Maybe my confrontation with it scared it away. Who knows? But what gets me is what was it doing there? What connection did it have to the factory? Or maybe it was looking for something from even further in the past. I did a little digging, but I couldn't find much information about the place before the factory was built. Perhaps I'll never know. The story I'm about to tell you happened several years back. I'd say it was around the summer of 2009 or 10. I was living in Hawaii at the time working as a lifeguard on one of those picturesque, postcard-like beaches. You know the ones with white sands and turquoise water. It was a little slice of paradise. By all accounts, it was a day like any other day. The sun was high in the sky, and the locals and tourists alike were lapping up the sun's rays. There were kids splashing in the waves near the shore, and surfers riding the swells. I've always loved the ocean ever since I was a kid, and I love being a lifeguard, but not for the reasons you might think. Sure, it's a cool job when you're in your 20s. You get to work every day by the water, and there's always something to keep you on your toes. But there was more to it than that. The routine, the rhythm, it was comforting to me. That particular day, though, I was on high alert. The ocean had been a bit rougher than usual. 
I was keeping an eye on the swimmers, making sure they stuck to the safe zones. There was always someone who would go out too far and get themselves in a pickle. I had to watch and make sure that didn't have the chance to happen. It wasn't until late afternoon that things started to get odd. We have our fair share of sea life around the beaches. Dolphins, sea turtles, heck, we'd even get the occasional curious seal. But they all have a particular behavior, a pattern you come to recognize. So when something out of the ordinary happens, you notice. The first thing that tipped me off was a strange smell. It was an unnatural foul odor. It was like rotting fish, only worse. I scanned the area for signs of a carcass. Occasionally, we'd get something dead that washed up from the ocean, but I couldn't find the source of this stench. It seemed to be coming from everywhere and yet nowhere all at once. And then, there was the sound. It was a low rumble, not quite like thunder, but it had a similar ground-shaking roar to it. It was like it was some enormous bellow from the depth of the ocean itself. At first, I thought it was my imagination. Maybe there was a storm coming, and it was just some charge in the atmosphere. Or maybe it was the wind. If I didn't know better, I would say it was the growl of a giant creature echoing from the ocean depths. I couldn't believe what I was feeling. My instinct was to raise the alarm, to get everyone out of the water. I was scanning the horizon, trying to see if abnormally large waves were heading our way, but nothing. Only the sound, the smell, and this sudden feeling of unease creeping over me like cold seawater. More than a little spooked, I grabbed my binoculars to get a closer look at the water's surface. Sure enough, there was something under the water. A dark shape, far too large to be any normal sea creature. It was enormous. My skin was crawling, my heart pounding, and every instinct I had was saying something was wrong. Yet the beachgoers were blissfully unaware. As I stood there, binoculars in hand, I couldn't help but think about all the legends I'd heard growing up. Stories of great sea serpents and terrifying monsters that lurk beneath the waves. I started to wonder if maybe, just maybe. But right then, I shook myself out of it. My job wasn't to get lost in fantasies and legends. So, I dialed down my panic and put my focus back on what mattered. I was there to maintain the safety of the people on the beach. Then, with no warning, the water erupted with a splash that seemed to shake the very earth beneath my feet. Swimmers screamed as the water churned with white froth and furious energy. A large shadow swiftly moved beneath the surface. I still wasn't sure what I was seeing, but I grabbed the megaphone and started yelling out instructions for everyone to get out of the water. Then, in one swift motion that still seemed surreal, the creature broke water. What I saw could have been straight from an old seafarer's nightmare. It was gigantic and serpentine in its shape, like a massive snake. Its colossal form gleamed sleek and wet, undulating underneath the roaring water surface. Atop its monstrous form were huge, malevolent eyes, aglow with a strange hypnotic light. I know this is going to sound strange, but its head almost looked like that of a dragon. It was an insane spectacle. The encounters I had had until then had been with sunburns, jellyfish stings, and the occasional leg cramp. I wasn't expecting to run into a sea serpent. Somehow, everyone managed to make it safely to land, and to my surprise, the creature didn't come ashore. It seemed to be a surprise to see us as we were to see it. After what seemed like an eternity, but was probably only a moment or two, it slid back beneath the surface of the water. The terrified hush that fell over the crowd was one I'll never forget. At the end of the day, all things considered, I guess I was lucky. We all were. I'm grateful no one was hurt. The sea hides so many secrets beneath her surface. And occasionally, just occasionally, she gives us a glimpse of her mystery. I can't say the ocean has ever been the same for me. I mean, I'm not surprised that something large and mysterious could be lurking down there undiscovered. The ocean is a big place after all. I just didn't expect to have to confront it in my lifetime. I'd like to tell you about this experience I had a couple of years back. It was during the fall, deep in the heart of Idaho. My family's been farming here for generations, and we thought we'd seen it all over the course of all the years we've been here. 
We've been through droughts, floods, infestations, crazy neighbors, you name it. But that year, something happened that we couldn't explain, something no one could have ever expected. The first strange occurrence was crops that started disappearing practically overnight. It was a slow sort of progression, a bushel of potatoes missing here, a few rows of corn that completely vanished. It was so strange. It wasn't like anything we'd ever dealt with before. There were no bite marks, no footprints, no disturbances in the dirt or weeds around the crops, or anywhere on the farm. It was as if the earth itself had simply swallowed anything up, or like it had just never been there to begin with. It didn't add up. Now, I'm no stranger to hard work and odd hours, but this situation had me up past midnight, every night. I always thought it might have been some weird harvest time prank, some kids from the local high school thinking they're being funny. That was the only thing I could think of that made a lick of sense. To catch them in the act, I decided to stake out my fields. I'd even picked out a spot atop a hill overlooking the property to watch from. I had a thermos full of coffee on one side and my farmer's almanac for some light reading to pass the time. I settled in for the long haul. The sun had just about raced over the horizon, leaving behind shades of brilliant oranges and pinks. Sunset always came early that time of year. The wind was rustling the leaves echoing a lullaby of sorts. Now city folks might find that kind of loneliness eerie, but for people like us, it's as comfortable as an old boot. There I was, perched on a creaky fold-out lawn chair, eyes peeled for any kind of disturbance in my field. I remember gazing at the skies that night, thinking how exactly the shades of dark blue and purple mirrored the wildflowers that grew along the edges of the fields. The hours ticked by in their own rhythm, a molasses-like slow dance of time only country folks know. In the icy silence, the rustling of leaves appeared much louder. Yet, the promised mischief didn't present itself. At around two in the morning, my head was bobbing. My eyelids were heavy, and I succumbed to the call of sleep. After all, nothing had stirred in the vast fields for hours but eventually I was jerked awake by a strange light. I blinked my eyes open and thought I had slept through the night, but this wasn't the morning sunlight that was greeting me. This was something else entirely. It was a surreal light, unlike anything I've seen, cast over my fields. Almost like a filter had blanketed the farm. I looked around for the source of the light and I couldn't believe how I had missed something so massive right in front of me. Right above the field was a gigantic craft, it was saucer-shaped, like a flattened ball. It spanned the width of the entire field. It glistened under its own lights. It was a dull, matte silver shade from what I could tell. But here's the creepiest part. It was dead silent. I couldn't hear any sounds of an engine or anything else that could be keeping it in the air. I had to rub my eyes several times, convinced this was some cruel trick of drowsiness. Maybe I was having a dream. That would make the most sense. But I was painfully aware that I was, in fact, awake and was overcome with an unbelievable reality right in front of me. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched it hover, performing painstakingly slow maneuvers in the midnight sky that defied physics. Trying to understand its purpose was akin to solving a puzzle without all the pieces. Was it observing us? Studying? With every minute its ominous presence persisted, the boundaries of my comprehension shrunk. I heard a strange noise, finally something other than the silence that seemed to have engulfed the countryside. But this wasn't an engine roar or mechanical whine. It was a low hum, kind of like an electronic buzz that echoed long after it disappeared. I couldn't shake off this feeling that it was communicating with someone or something nearby. And then, as suddenly as it appeared, it shot off into the night sky like a pebble disappearing into a pond. It stirred a whirl of bright blue light in its wake before disappearing. I was left standing alone in my field, bathed in the mundane darkness once more, with nothing but scarecrow silhouettes for company. In the aftermath, it was hard to shake off the eerie sensation of that encounter. Sleep eluded me and was replaced by paranoia and fear. Many nights I found myself scanning the night sky waiting for the ungodly light show to begin again. My wife made countless cups of chamomile, hoping to lull me to sleep. But the image of that hovering saucer 
burn behind my eyelids every time I closed them. Everyone I told thought I was insane. Sometimes I try to convince myself that it was just a dream and not a brush with the inexplicable, otherworldly beings that we share our universe with. But I know what I saw out there, and I know that it wasn't just a vivid dream or my imagination from a sleepless night. There is something else out there, whether we want to admit it or not. First off, I need to tell you about my job. I'm a plumber. I've been doing the job for a couple of years now. And already, I've seen my fair share of rats in people's pipes. Your occasional snake as well. But that's about as far as I get with strange animal encounters. But this one job that I got called to, well, it's something I'll never forget. That's for sure. It was just your average Tuesday in late July. Nothing spectacular. The day was hot but the air conditioning in my truck made it manageable. It was around 2.30 p.m. when I got a call from an older lady. She was frantic, I mean completely hysterical. Apparently something was wrong with her plumbing, but she couldn't describe the problem to me. Sometimes older people can be a little weird about things. They have a sense of urgency that's just not necessary, like every little thing is a crisis. So I didn't think too much of it at the time. I took down her address and told her I would head her way when I finished up on my current job. The house was an old-fashioned cottage, one you'd imagine you'd find tucked away in some European countryside. As soon as I walked into the place, I got smacked in the face with this overwhelming odor. It was something I hadn't smelled before, like a mixture of chemicals and organic matter, not your normal plumbing smells. I tried to ignore the smell and made my way to the bathroom. As I got down to open the piping under the sink, I heard this, this whimper. It was low, like a growl, but uncannily human-like. I shook it off thinking it was just the sounds of old pipes, and that I was reading too much into the situation. I flushed the pipes to ensure there wasn't a clog in the system, and that's when I saw it. In the mirrored finish on the copper piping, a shadow moved across the floor behind me. I quickly turned around, but there was nothing there. I started to move on and not think about it, but I couldn't. I started to check out the rest of the house for the source of the problem. As I walked around, inspecting the walls for possible leaks or seepage, I could have sworn I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. Again, what looked like the tail end of a coat, then moved around a corner. Figuring it was the owner, I shouted, Ma'am, is that you? But I got no response. Something felt off. The air was suddenly cold and I could practically taste the metallic tinge of iron in the air. I made my way to the kitchen, and then I felt it. A gust of icy wind, so powerful it nearly knocked me over. It was as if something had just passed me at high speed. The kitchen was dark, almost too dark for a sunny afternoon. But what made me really uneasy was the fact that everything was in perfect order, too perfect. It felt like I was being watched. I convinced myself it was all in my mind, that it's just the oddities of an old house. I couldn't find anything wrong with this lady's plumbing. I called out to her to give her the rundown before I left, but I didn't get any response. Where did she go? As I was packing my tools away, I heard something. It was a whisper, and it sounded eerily like my name. I looked around and even checked outside, thinking maybe it was somebody in the street, but no one was there but I distinctly heard someone whispering my name. It was then that I realized that the whisper wasn't from inside the house at all. It seemed like it was in my head. Feeling apprehensive, I decided to share my experience with the lady of the house when she finally found me. However, her reaction was not what I expected. Upon hearing my story, she grew silent and then asked me if I would be willing to return in the evening. She had someone she wanted me to meet, someone who knew a lot about the history of the house. I don't know what I was thinking, but I agreed to come back later in the evening. For what exactly? I didn't quite know. When I returned to the cottage that night, I saw a different car parked out front. It was old, beat up like it was straight out of the 70s. As I approached the house, I noticed the same stench of sulfur and burnt meat, only much stronger. I hesitated at the door before finally knocking. The woman who answered was shrouded in a rich velvet cloak. Her eyes were older than her face, like they've seen centuries. She introduced herself as Annabelle, 
a local historian, and a medium. Seeing the mix of confusion and fear on my face, the woman simply smiled and invited me in. We all gathered in the same kitchen where I'd encountered that icy gust. That room was still cold, colder than the rest of the house. Suddenly, the floral patterned wallpaper, the porcelain dining set, and the meticulously polished cutlery seemed unsettling. The medium placed an old-looking book on the table, and I saw a shift in the homeowner's face. She looked nervous. She then began to explain that the house, built in the late 1800s, had been a site of demonic interactions. The previous owners in the early 1900s claimed to have been tormented by an entity they described having a grotesque, human-like form with large black wings. They said it was as tall as the room and had a muscular physique, covered in a kind of gray, metallic skin. They said its eyes glowed, almost like they were filled with fire. What happened next chilled me to the bone. The medium started to speak in languages I cannot describe. The room went dead still. Then she looked up. Her irises were completely black. Then I heard something just behind me. It was so close, it felt like the whisper was being breathed into my very soul. A growling voice hissed my name. My heart was pounding, both in terror and disbelief. Whatever this was, it was not from this world. After that strange hair-raising encounter, we were told that the interaction probably occurred because it wanted something. The medium couldn't or wouldn't specify what that something could be, leaving us in the limbo of an unresolved tension. Whatever was haunting this lady's house was making noises with the plumbing. Sometimes her water would run blood red and there would be pipes banging in the night. I checked everything again and was unable to find anything wrong. She brought me back that night along with the medium to try to get the monster to act up so that maybe we could find a problem we could fix. I think she was hoping we would be able to tell her it was all in her head, but that didn't turn out to be the case. It was the only job I was unable to fix. Even now, as I continue with my simpler plumbing jobs, that encounter hasn't left me. Everyone who works in the trades has a story of some crazy homeowner or some wild job, but I bet few of them have encountered anything like this. It was a typical foggy morning out in the swamps of Louisiana. I was setting out for another fishing escapade. That's how I spent all my free time. I couldn't get enough of it. There's just something about early morning fishing trips that ground me. It's a kind of meditation in a way. I've been casting a line into these murky waters before I could even write my name, long before life got complicated. While the swamps might not seem to be as calming as a milder place, like an inland lake or river, it was my home. There's just something about the smell of the water and the sounds of the cypress leaves that make this place oddly beautiful. There was a thin layer of fog rolling off the water that morning. I remember it well. There was a chill in the air. It would get warm and sticky later in the day, but right then, the weather was perfect. Insects had begun to wake from their chill-induced slumber and started up their buzzing and chirping. I'd begun rigging my pole. It was a simple setup, but sometimes simple was best. I threaded an earthworm onto the hook and cast it out, the plunk echoing subtly as it hit the murky swamp ahead. Now, I don't know exactly when it started, but there was this strange, eerie feeling hanging in the air. The usual sounds of the natural world had started to feel quiet, too quiet. The persistent and comforting buzz of the insects had died down almost completely, and the usual bird calls were missing. It almost felt like the entire swamp was frozen in some unnatural muted silence, like the landscape around me was waiting for something to happen. Engrossed in my routine, I initially dismissed it as the fog playing tricks on my mind, but this discomforting feeling refused to budge, wrapping around me tighter than the damp, chilly air. Accompanying this feeling was a strange, noxious smell. It seemed unnatural for the swamp, it reminded me of burnt matches, but there was a hint of something rotten and nauseating along with it. I've smelled some strange things in this swamp, but nothing quite like this. I ignored it for a bit, but things began to escalate. There were these strange sounds, subtle at first, like a soft growl, the low tone rumbling across the swamp. 
I didn't recognize it as any of the local critters. It grew stronger as the moments passed. I could no longer ignore it anymore. It was definitely something growling, but I couldn't see where it was coming from, or any hint at what the creature behind the noise was. The growling was deep, unsettling, like distant thunder rolling across an angry sky. I remember a chill ran down my spine as I sat there in my boat, deep in my uncanny discomfort. The morning fog began to thicken even more, engulfing everything around me. Out of the white haze, a dark figure began to emerge slowly. It was hunched low, but I could make out the form of a four-legged creature stalking the shore. Was it a dog? I couldn't see it clearly enough to tell for certain. It seemed too large. Maybe a black bear then? But it didn't move like a bear either. The fog lifted for a moment, and I finally was able to see the creature's true form. It was canine in nature, but there was something terribly wrong about it. It had dark, possibly black fur, adorned with protruding, bony spikes that seemed to come right out of its muscles. The head was wolf-like, its ears twitched listening to its surroundings. But when it locked eyes with me, they went flat back against its head. Its eyes were the worst part. They glowed this terrifying orange, like hollowed out pumpkins lit from within. The eerie light from them was the only thing that cut through the enveloping fog. It stalked the shoreline and bared its teeth. I don't think I've ever seen teeth like those. Sharp, oversized, and looking like they could chew through metal just as easily as they could tear flesh. A foul, unnatural smell of sulfur and flesh filled the air. The stench was undoubtedly coming from this creature. I remember looking around the boat frantically, and my eyes landed on the box of flares I had. It was a safety measure I carried during foggy days, a way to signal others for help if my boat went down out here. But right now, it seemed like my only hope of defense. I fumbled around, heart pounding as I managed to light one up. I waved the flare towards the terrifying beast. The bright, fiery light cut across the foggy swamp as I swung it, illuminating the creature in an eerie red glow. The animal let out a deep, thunderous growl, retreating a few steps back, which gave me enough courage to push on. Finally, the flare burst into a shower of sparks, the sudden burst causing the creature to retreat into the fog. I could still hear its growls, but they were growing distant now. It was leaving. My hands were shaking as I put the burned out flare down, my mind buzzing with the surreal reality of what just happened. How could something like that even be real? The rotten smell and the adrenaline coursing through me was assurance that I had not imagined it. As I made my way back, the swamp whispered in quiet sounds once again. I never figured out what that thing was and I don't think I really want to. I still go out fishing that way, but I make sure to avoid those foggy mornings, and that seems to have worked thus far. I don't know if that thing had something to do with that fog or not, but I've managed to go without encountering it since. My mistake was ignoring all those signs that something wasn't right. I should have taken my boat out of the water the moment I felt that uncanny chill down my spine that seemed to come from nowhere. I've got a wild story for you. It shook me to the bone, and I've even been to Afghanistan. My wife and I decided to disappear to the Smoky Mountains for a weekend last summer. Rita and I love nature. We both grew up with the mountains in our backyards, living off the grid. We knew all the local creatures of the forest, but we're definitely aware that things aren't always as they seem. I mean, there is more out there in the wild places of the world than most of us want to admit. We were eager for this trip, just the wilderness, a clear smoky mountain sky, and each other for the company. We set up our camp near a trailhead intending to take on some light hiking the following day. Rita made some delicious campfire chili and beans. Because, well, nothing beats the taste of good food in the outdoors. After dinner, we organized our little campsite for nightfall. We knew that the area we were hiking had a healthy black bear population, so proper food storage was crucial. The day had been beautiful. The Smokies really lived up to their name. The hazy view seemed almost straight out of a dream. After an evening by the fire, we decided to retire early. As we nestled into the tent, the night grew quieter than before. It was cold, but it had a calm about it. However, one thing that was strange 
was that the night was too silent. There have always been nighttime sounds in the wild that blended, nature's white noise, if you will. But that night, the wilderness was uncannily muted. You know that feeling that something is terribly off, but can't put your finger on it? Well, I felt that. Like the night was waiting, waiting for something to happen. Rita said she felt it too. I could even see it in her eyes. The moon was flickering, casting long, shifting shadows amidst the trees. We talked in hushed voices, as if scared to pierce the night's quiet veil. It started as a low grumble from the darkness beyond the reach of the campsite. It was slow and resonating, breaking the silence like a thunderclap. It was bone-chilling to say the least. Rita squeezed my arm, her fingers biting through my shirt. Moments later it sounded again, closer, clearer, a harsh growl that reverberated in the stillness. And then it sounded again. It sounded to be coming from all different directions. Was it only one beast circling our campsite, or were there several? Every growl was a deafening whisper in the haunted silence. I couldn't discern a wolf or a bear or anything I knew in those sounds. To say we were panicking would be an understatement. We spent the rest of the night wide awake, glued to our sleeping bags, our heartbeats synchronizing with each other, along with every growl from the dark. A part of me desperately wished it was all a dream, but the sharp realism of our mounting fear left no room to mistake the truth. Then, just when we were hoping to see dawn and face whatever the hell was lurking out there, a change swept over us. There was something that made us both turn towards the tent flap that was still slightly open. Without exchanging a word, I knew Rita had seen what I did. There, in the dark, maybe no more than a few yards away from our tent, were these two fiery spots, like glowing embers. They were a reddish-orange against the darkness. I recognized them as eyes, and I'll tell you, I cannot describe the terror I felt. Then, more eyes appeared from different directions, mirroring the hellfire that burned in the first pair. The growls we'd heard were back, louder and more menacing than before as we realized that these were far more than typical predators. I could detect a repulsive sour smell in the air, something between burning flesh and sulfur, an unnatural smell for the forest. This realization bolted me into action. Adrenaline overpowered my fear. I jerked up, yanked the zipper open, and started tossing our stuff into the backpack. Rita mirrored my actions, her desperate speed matching mine. The eyes were closing in, our fire dying out, and the howls, those spine-chilling howls, were relentless. Once we had everything we could grab, we bolted. We ran like our lives depended on it, which I'm pretty sure they did. We didn't stop until we reached our pickup. The drive back home was mostly silent, wilderness giving way to civilization, carrying a certain comfort that words failed to offer. We reached home by the crack of dawn, exhausted, shaken, and eternally grateful for escaping that situation unscathed. For days we questioned what we experienced that night, dissecting each detail, searching for something, anything that could add a touch of normalcy to our experience. But every discussion circled back to one haunting conclusion. Those weren't any ordinary wild animals. The memory of that night has buried itself in our hearts, chilling our passion for camping. It has become a tale we recount, our own personal ghost story. Only we know how much of it is true, how soul-shaking it was, and how we continue to sleep with the lights on, waiting for the growls to return one silent night. I have a wild story for you. This was a few years back, mid-summer. Place was Two Wound Bay, a great little spot to catch some waves on the central coast of Australia. I've been in love with surfing since my dad, a champion surfer in his own right, got me on a board when I was just a little sprite. And to this day, there's just something about riding down the face of a monster wave that gets me going back into the water year after year. So, there I was, waiting in the lineup for a decent wave to come along, just enjoying the clear blue sky and the sun on my back. It might sound like an odd thing for a bloke to say, but on days like those, it's almost like you're dancing with the ocean itself. We got into a rhythm where I'd spring to my feet, flying down the wall of the wave, 
before cutting back and forth, riding the lip of the curl. Truly nothing quite matches that adrenaline rush. It was during one such ride, while carving my mark on a shoulder-high wave, that I noticed something odd. The water was usually crystal clear, but I saw an odd shadow under the surface. I figured it was a school of fish, or maybe even a dolphin, though none had been spotted earlier. It was strange, as the dark shape seemed too big and too still to be either. Curious, but feeling a gnawing unease starting to creep in, I decided to investigate. After riding the wave back to shore, I took a deep breath and decided to swim out towards the spot. Here's where things start to get hairy. The water was a bit cooler than expected in the area where the shadow was. That's not too abnormal itself, but the stench. It was like nothing I'd ever smelled before. It was like a fresh compost pile. Not something you'd expect to find out here in the water. There must be something else nearby, but I couldn't see anything. The shadowy figure below the water was turning even murkier by the second. I tried diving down, thinking maybe there was a chunk of shipwreck buried in the sand or something. But each time I tried to get closer to the shadow, it slipped away from me, almost as though it was avoiding me. I chalked it up to a trick of light, or maybe my imagination, but then something brushed against my leg. It wasn't like seaweed or a stray jellyfish. It was firmer, dense, and definitely unnatural. I swear, my heart fell into my guts, and suddenly it was all too real. Rising from the shadowy depths, an odd figure surfaced in front of me. I don't know how to say this without sounding totally off my rocker, but it looked like an alien. It was smallish, probably around my height and skinny. Its head was unmistakably larger than its body, a bit similar to those bobblehead toys. The most striking part, though, were the eyes. They were large and black, like pools of ink eating up its face. As soon as I saw that thing in front of me, this feeling of pure terror gripped my guts. I bolted. Pure adrenaline pumped through my veins as I paddled back towards the shore as fast as my arms and legs would go. I barely managed to get ashore before collapsing on the sand, gasping for air and shaking like a leaf. The sense of relief that washed over me, knowing I was no longer in the ocean with that nightmare, was indescribable. In the days, weeks, and months following the encounter, I found myself replaying the incident in my head, over and over again. Was it truly what I think I saw? Could I have hallucinated the whole thing? Maybe it was just some inflatable toy, and I was just totally confused and mistaken. But then, I remember that dark pool and that putrid smell. It was real, as real as the sea beneath me that day. Since then, surfing hasn't been the same for me. I've been back in the water, but each time I go, I feel the shadow of that encounter. I'm still not sure what I think about that day. What was that thing doing in the ocean? Was it truly an alien, or was it some aquatic species of human? I doubt I'll ever figure it out, and part of me doesn't even want to. I'm a fisherman up here in Maine, been doing it all my life as did my father and his father before him did. It was a day like any other and I just set my boat off to this remote island. It was a secret little honey hole of mine where the haddock were always biting. Only this time, the sea's normally vibrant dark blue surface was littered with the bodies of dead fish. Strange, I thought. Not at all like any red tide I'd ever seen. Now I'm not a man of superstitions, but this left me with questions. I thought there must be some sort of logical explanation, but I'll be honest with you, it creeped me the hell out. These were some prime haddock, young and robust, their life snuffed out way before time, and there wasn't a goddamn seagull in sight. I mean, that made me even more unsettled. Why aren't the birds taking an easy meal? That wasn't normal, not at all. I decided that I'm not just hauling these dead fish to shore without finding out what the devil was going on. So, with an uneasy feeling gnawing at my gut, I started my little investigation. And man, what I found next was something straight out of Lovecraft's worst nightmares. I threw a net over the side and I hauled in those dead fish. Every single one of them had this peculiar look on their faces. Imagine the look a man might have if he saw the devil himself. 
Now picture that on a fish. Eyes wide with primal fear, gills distended, and mouths agape as if they'd spent their final moments in silent screaming. The water around the island seemed murkier than the rest of the sea. Maybe there was something toxic in the water? I dropped anchor some yards away and rowed across to avoid disturbing the waters. The strange tang of brimstone was clear as day, slightly masked by the familiar scent of the sea-drenched air. I found an inky black hole, an underwater cavern that was darker than a moonless night. Figured that's where the trouble was coming from. A shiver trickled down my spine, not from the cold main wind blowing across the open water, but from an unsettling feeling washing over me. It was like I was being watched, not by a pair of eyes, but countless ones. Like the whole sea was watching me. The sea was still around the cavern. The waves seemed to hush their roaring melody as I neared it. I still don't know what I was thinking when I decided to explore that dark cavern. Its entrance was just below the water's surface. I could see it from the boat. As I pulled off my gear and dived in, the water froze me to my core. I had never been in water that cold before. It was as if this dark hole swallowed all warmth and light around it. Down I went, propelled by a mix of fear, curiosity, and a foolish sense of adventure. Soon I noticed a strange undercurrent, a jarring contrast to the calm of the sea. I pushed against it, my lungs ached for air, yet something coaxed me deeper into the inky abyss. It was like something was calling me there. All of a sudden, I encountered an entity hovering just above the cavern floor. Its size varied dynamically as if morphing at will. One moment, it was no bigger than a small dog, and the next, it towered intimidatingly above me. It was a ghastly sight, like no creature known to man. Horns, or what looked like horns, protruded from what appeared to be its head, and large, leathery wings were folded behind it. Its scales seemed to flicker darkly, releasing a pungent brimstone-like odor. Its eyes, if you could call them that, glowed a deep red, filled with a predatory fire that made my heart hammer like a runaway jackhammer. Abruptly, I found myself captured in its gaze, frozen by an overwhelming sense of terror and dread. The creature, whatever it was, radiated raw power. And I'll tell you, there was no worse sound I ever heard than that thing's laughter. It was like an amalgamation of many voices like the collective voices of the damned hissing and mocking, reverberating off the cave walls, chilling my blood. Something broke me from that horrific trance, an old dagger given to me by my father. Just a trinket, he said, but it had an etched cross on the hill. It was my only link back to sanity. I pulled it out from my belt. Its steel glinted dimly in the aquatic dusk. On seeing this, the creature's fiery eyes widened in what seemed like shock and without a second thought, I kicked my way to the surface. As I broke through the water, gasping like a beached haddock myself, I looked back at the cavern. I swear I could still feel those eyes on me. I swam back, got on my boat, and gunned the engine. In seconds, the island, that dark hole, and the thrumming malice were behind me. The next day, I contemplated whether that really happened. I couldn't believe I went in the water, but it was like I was being called like I wasn't in control of my own body. I've never been back to that island since, nor have I shared this story with anyone else before. After all, who'd believe me? A humble fisherman regaling them with tales of sea monsters and demons. Looking back now, I realize how fortunate I was to escape. We're not alone out here, that's for sure. Driving a taxi around New Orleans at night is kind of like being in a waking dream. There's something eerie about the city. It's so vibrant, bustling, loud, and yet mysterious. And that wave of mystery only deepens after dark. There's a lot of history in this city, and sometimes it just so happens to seep out after sundown. I've been a cabbie here for about six years, and I've definitely seen my fair share of oddities. Most nights, my shift starts gracefully. The city, heavy with the setting sun, settles into a kind of quietness that's only found in the deep corners of the night. Now, I'll be honest, when I first started driving the night shift, I wasn't sure what to expect. But from the moment my tires kissed the streets, 
something clicked. It felt like home, a hidden world made just for me and all the nocturnal wanderers. Before I get into any business of shadows or ghostly figures, let's talk about New Orleans neighborhoods. There are so many to explore, each with its distinct character and ambiance. The French Quarter, with its lively pubs and tourist-filled streets. Treme, laden with the culture of the Deep South. The Garden District, adorned with historic mansions cloaked in moss-draped oaks. You get to appreciate them differently after dark. They each have their own personality, and you get to know it pretty well as a late-night driver. Anyhow, it was on one of these usual nights when I was floating through the maze of roads, just doing my job. The last customer of the evening was just some random tourist, slightly tipsy, and trying to interpret the city's energy. He stumbled out of my car somewhere near Bourbon Street and disappeared into the mysterious embrace of the rolling fog. Normal stuff for me. It was right around 2 in the morning and the city seemed to take a breath. The neighborhoods were getting quiet and empty. I was moving hazily through the garden district, the large oaks forming a ghostly canopy above me. Just as I was about to call it a night, my attention was drawn to a silvery figure on the side of the road. There was nothing really distinctive about her, just another passenger. But there was something, maybe a shimmer around her, or the way the streetlight refracted through her, that made me feel a curious sensation of disquiet. She lifted her hand and gestured for me to stop. And, well, a ride is a ride, especially on a slow night. I pulled over, sliding to halt right alongside her. She climbed into the back seat. There was something odd about her. Her skin was almost glowing, and I don't mean that she had nice skin. I mean there was a glow, like a glowing light emanating from her. She was pale as fog, with hollow eyes that seemed to hold the secrets of centuries. Her destination, she said, just drive. I didn't know quite how to respond, so I did what she asked. I drove. Soon after we started our journey, the electric systems of the taxi seemed to go haywire. The radio dial spun wildly on its own. I couldn't help but steal glances of her through my rearview mirror. Her skin still seemed to have that faint glow. I hadn't been imagining it, but there was something else too. There was a chill in the air that overtook me as soon as she entered the cab. I was beginning to think I'd picked up a ghost. Throughout the ride, whispers echoed around faint and unintelligible, but undoubtedly there, just at the very edge of hearing. I couldn't tell if they came from her, or perhaps there was something else here, unseen, accompanying the strange woman. After what seemed like an eternity, the woman asked me to stop in front of a grand old mansion. It looked as though time had forgotten it. I turned my eyes towards the meter. Each tick felt like a heartbeat in the eerie silence. As I announced the fare and waited for my payment, I stole another glance back. Only this time, the back seat was emptier than a ghost town. I rubbed my eyes, thinking maybe the fatigue of the night was casting shadows. But no matter how much I wished it was all just a hallucination, I knew I didn't just drive there on my own accord. I looked back at the mansion. It was a mere shadow of its former grandeur, and in the cool light of the moon, it seemed to have disappeared much like my ghostly fare. The faint echo of the whispers still hung about the car, a chilling reminder of the spectral journey. But as suddenly and ghostly they had arisen, they disappeared into the ether, leaving no hint of their presence either. I sat for a moment, frozen in my disbelief, my heart pounding like a war drum in my chest. I drove off striving to shake off the experience as if it were a bad dream, yet somehow knowing deep in my bones it was all too real. The night in the city had changed for me. Each shadow cast in the corners looked like a lurking phantom. Each light appeared as an otherworldly glow. The same streets I knew like the back of my hand were shrouded in a mysteriously spectral veil. I was, and still am, equal parts spooked and fascinated. After all, how many can claim to have given a ghost a taxi ride? While the encounter was unsettling, the ghostly woman didn't have any ill will towards me. She didn't try to scare me or harm me in any way. She merely wanted a taxi ride and that's fine by me. I've had worse customers than her.
This occurred a few years back, towards the end of summer while I was living in Alaska. I was a park ranger at one of our beautiful national parks, tucked away in the Alaska Range, where the wilderness stretches as far as your eyes can see, and civilization seems like it's a thing of memory. Being in that park, so far removed, life becomes a whole different world. So to be honest, before this all happened, there were always these odd occurrences in the park. Odd sounds in the night, shadows moving in a way they shouldn't. They seemed to be just something I had to get used to. But nothing, and let me stress nothing, could have prepared me for what happened that one summer evening in the park. This particular day was like any other initially. I spent the morning as I typically would, conducting my usual patrol rounds, checking in at designated spots, ensuring the park rules were observed and the wildlife was undisturbed. It felt peaceful, almost routine, but that tranquility was broken abruptly during my evening rounds. As the sun began to sink behind the Serret Peaks, I was making my way down a trail that bordered the woods. The haunting calls of distant owls were replaced with a sound that didn't belong to the usual wilderness melody I was used to. It was a growl of some sort, low-pitched and it almost felt pained in some way. Like the creature who made it was in distress, concerned it might be an injured animal or maybe a bear that had come too close to the trail, I readied my tranquilizer gun. I followed the sound, veering off the trail and venturing deeper into the underbrush. Let me tell you, no matter how long you've been a ranger, there's something unnerving about tracking a probable bear through the Alaskan forest. My heart pounded in my chest with a wild rhythm, disturbing the eerie hush of the wilderness around me. The growls grew louder and more distinct as I drew closer. Oddly enough, they began to mutate and transformed from a deep growl to something that eerily resembled a human groan. Mixed in with the animal sounds were whispers. I kid you not, I also heard human whispers. Just thinking about it makes me nauseous all over again. The whispers grew louder as I proceeded, as if carried by the light wind through the trees. It was impossible to make out what was being said. It was like trying to understand a conversation happening in a dream. It just didn't make sense, it was impossible. I felt like I should have turned back long ago, but for some reason, I kept moving forward. Before long, I stumbled upon a small clearing in the woods, the whispering sounds echoing around me. I shone my flashlight frantically all around. The dense shadows thrown by the pine and birch trees made it difficult to discern anything clearly. Suddenly, just at the edge of the clearing, my flashlight beam landed on a figure, tall and vaguely human-shaped. Even in the low light, I could tell it wasn't a human, at least not entirely. The best I can describe it, it was like it was part human and part animal. It had characteristics of both. I was terrified. But on the job, you learn to keep your head. So I steeled myself and aimed my tranquilizer gun at the strange figure. In that quiet standoff between the unknown and me, my senses were filled with an overwhelming and unearthly musk, like wet earth animal fur, and something else, something rotten. Just then, the creature, this figure, it spoke. I can still recall its voice. It was as if it was drawn from the very essence of the wild, imitating something human. But the sound was harsh, more bestial. It was a language I couldn't understand. Maybe I knew it. I don't know, but there were words. This wasn't some garbled animal sound. It could speak. I stood frozen unsure of what to do, my mind spinning, trying to make sense of a situation that threatened to break apart everything I thought I knew about reality. To be honest, I still don't know what to make of it. The figure seemed to shed its skin and morph into what I can only describe as a nightmare. It was approximately six feet tall and stood upright. Its body was gangly. The skin stretched tight across its frame like a drum that had been pulled too tight. Its eyes were what really caught me off guard. They were glowing like two piercing orbs of celestial light, a yellowish hue that seemed to burn from within. As my light washed over it, I could finally make out that it indeed had a form of an animal, almost like a pale deer combined with a wolf or a fox. It was hairless and almost glowed beneath the light. And then, as though the situation wasn't terrifying enough, the creature spoke again. It was that same language, unknown to me. 
It paused and watched for my reaction, and then it spoke again. Leave, is what it said the next time. I stumbled backward, my mind whirring with adrenaline. I backed away, my tranquilizer gun raised, not daring to take my flashlight beam off it. That standoff didn't last long. Whatever this thing was, it was giving me an out, and I took it. I turned around and bolted, panic adding wings to my feet. All the while, the eerie echo of its voice trailed me. When I finally made it back to my ranger station, I locked the doors and windows and stayed up all night, every little sound making me jumpy. The entire incident may have lasted for just a few minutes, but it felt like a lifetime, and I haven't been the same since. That dense wilderness was no longer just a sanctuary of natural beauty. It held creatures unexplainable, bearing darkness underneath its lush appeal. I kept the night's events to myself, buried under the regularities of life, hoping to wash it away with the passage of time. I often think back to that encounter and wonder what would have become of me if I didn't heed its warning if I hadn't run away in time. I'm a retired covert operative. A few years back, I was part of a task force deployed along Somalia's coast. Not a vacation spot by any stretch. The land was arid and the heat blistering. It was hostile territory. Unpredictable danger lurking around every corner. You don't quite know fear until you've been sent to operate in a place where every footstep could mean the difference between life and death. When the mission details came, I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. But as an operative, your job is to deal with the cards you've been dealt. Our task was simple on paper. Intel suggested there was an illegal arms cache in an isolated location away from the populated areas, hidden within some remote coastal cliffs. Our job was to get in, gather photographic evidence, get out, and get that evidence back to HQ. Easy enough, right? Our first night, we moved like ghosts, hugging the rugged coastline. The moon was a thin crescent, casting long, eerie shadows across the landscape. It wasn't enough light to see by, but we couldn't use any artificial light for fear of being discovered. We had to navigate around the watchful eyes of hostile patrols and the treacherous cliffs in the dark. Our second day was spent holed up in an abandoned fisherman's hut by the sea, waiting for the cover of night again. The heat was punishing, the silence deafening, the stench of salt water, decaying seaweed, and dried fish guts was a constant reminder of our less than desirable accommodations. It didn't take long for me to notice something off. I brushed it off as just mission anxiety playing tricks on my mind. But then, there was a distinct smell that slowly seeped through our shelter. It was pungent, like wet dog, only amplified tenfold. It got stronger as the day went on. Whatever we did, we couldn't escape it. Around dusk, as I stepped out to relieve myself, the smell was almost unbearable. It was then I heard something that sent electric shocks through my arms and legs, a sound that still haunts me to this day. Even though it wasn't anything menacing at that moment, just a faint whooping sound in the distance. It was oddly out of place in the otherwise silent landscape. With the arrival of night, we resumed our mission, making steady progress through the labyrinth of cliffs and caves. I couldn't shake off the unsettling feeling of being watched and the recurring whoops reverberating through the wind made it increasingly worse. We all looked at each other when we heard the noises, but nobody said anything. We had a mission to complete, and we couldn't be distracted by some strange animal in the night. Somewhere around midnight, as we navigated around a particularly unforgiving cliff, we had our first encounter with the creature. A shadowy figure stood tall against the stars on a nearby ridge. It was massive its hulking silhouette hazy in the faint moonlight. While it was far off, I could still make out its small, beady eyes. They seemed to glow in the darkness. My every instinct was screaming danger, but the figure was far off, and not directly in our path. So we moved on. We all saw it, but no one wanted to admit what we thought we were looking at. The beast was big, much bigger than any human or local wildlife that we knew existed in that area. However, it stood upright like a man, and yet, we could all see that the creature was covered in thick hair all over its body. 
We knew where our mission lay, and an encounter with an unidentified creature was not part of the plan. We would have time to discuss our thoughts later, for now we had to keep moving. We took a path that avoided the creature and went on our way. As we moved cautiously away from the figure on the ridge, the smell grew stronger and the peculiar whooping sound fell quiet. My mind raced, aligning all the weird instances we'd encountered since our arrival. I was sure they were all connected to the creature, suddenly overrun with adrenaline and alertness. Every sound, every shadow, seemed to magnify in the desolate landscape. We reached a narrow path, a steep cliff to our left, and a ravine to our right. The wind whistled, carrying the putrid smell stronger than before. I had a feeling of being watched, and I knew deep down that the creature was getting close now, too close for comfort. Suddenly a hair-raising growl echoed through the night. It sounded primeval, prowling on the edges of human comprehension. Its raw power, the untamed savagery behind it, shook me to my core. I feel the memories echoing even now as I recall everything. In the faint moonlight, I saw it, up close this time. Was this the same creature we all saw on the ridge earlier in the night? Or were there several of these things? These were questions I wasn't sure I wanted answers to. The beast was massive and hulking against the cliffside, at least 12 feet tall if I had to guess. It was covered from head to toe in long, reddish-brown hair. It stood hunched over a carcass, and we likely interrupted its evening meal. I was sure this was a different individual from the one we saw earlier. But that begs the question, how many more of these things are out here? It turned its cone-shaped head toward us, the small, beady eyes glowed ominously in the pale moonlight. Its face almost resembled that of a caveman. The skin appeared darker and hairless compared to the rest of its body. As the moonlight glinted off its large chest and wide shoulders, I clicked my throat mic for backup, our only chance of escape. In an unvoiced agreement, my crew slowly began to retreat, each step painstakingly calculated to avoid alerting the monster. I kept my eyes glued onto its moving silhouette, my hand closing over the cool handle of my sidearm. Even as we moved further away, every instinct screamed to run, but our training kept us rooted. With the incessant growling still echoing in the wind, we somehow moved out of sight, taking cover behind a cluster of boulders. We held our breath, hearts racing and eyes straining in the dark for the beast's silhouette. Minutes turned into hours before the chilling sounds slowly died out, swallowed by the tidal waves crashing against the rocky cliffside. We only had a few moments to rest and catch our breaths before we continued our mission. We managed to gather our evidence, holstered our weapons, and called in an immediate extraction. The familiar growl of our extraction chopper dulled the edge of fear that had grown sharper with each passing moment. Once aboard, I stole a final glance down at the moonlit cliffs. The sinking feeling in my gut hadn't dissipated, but mingled with a dash of relief. I looked back at my team, our unspoken camaraderie echoing in our mutual sigh of relief. Though some attributed the creature to being nothing more than a concoction of tired minds and night shadows, I knew what we saw was real. We all saw it. The question of its existence, its purpose, and its place in our world gnawed at me making me question our understanding of the natural world. My encounter with what I now identify as the Sasquatch remains one of the most unexplainable experiences of my life. I thought I might share a peculiar event I had while on duty a couple of years back. This was near the end of fall when the nights are starting to get a chill to them and I was still working the graveyard shift as a responding officer out here in Lafayette, Louisiana. Now, as for Lafayette, it's got its fair share of eccentricities, but what place doesn't have its own batch of local lore and spooky happenings? I've had more than my fair share of weird calls in the city, but this one I'm about to tell you stands out a bit more than the rest. I still don't have a solid explanation for it. I got a call mid-shift, a complaint from some distressed folks living out near the swamps. They claimed they were hearing some bizarre and loud noises in the dead of the night. I remember thinking about it for a moment, listening to the dispatcher relay the details. It sounded like a wildlife issue, if I'm honest. 
which wasn't really my area of expertise. But it was a slow night, so I decided to make the drive out and see if I could figure out what was going on. The swamp's a lively place at night, filled with all sorts of critters making a commotion. I was betting the caller was new to the area and just wasn't used to our brand of wilderness yet. While en route, I recall this distinct eeriness crawling up my spine. It was a strange, unexplainable unease that I attributed to the late hour and my excessive use of caffeine that night. If you've never lived in the South, I can tell you that swamps have an old kind of silent magic about them during the daytime. And at night, well, that magic can turn a touch creepy. But my mom always told me, ain't no spooks or spirits to be afraid of in this world. You need to only fear the living. The night was unusually quiet. Even the chatter in the police radio seemed oddly soft as I neared the vicinity. Turning off the main road and onto a lesser used dirt path leading towards the house, the rich, earthy smell of swamp mud and moss drifted into the patrol car. I took a look around when I arrived, casting my car's headlights in the beam from my flashlight over the swamp that stretched out around the property. I didn't see signs of anything out of place, but that didn't mean much. The swamp can hide a great many things when it wants to. I walked up to the house, knocked on the door. The homeowner was a jittery old man who looked like he was seeing ghosts. He said the noises came every other night, like a soft hush that grew into a loud wail, ending always in a frantic splash in the waters. It sure seemed like some wild animal to me. I kept my patrol car parked close by, and I ventured on foot to the swamp edge, being careful not to tread onto anything unfriendly. I shone the flashlight up into the trees, looking for any signs that pointed to what might be causing this ruckus. The light bounced off the thick veil of Spanish moss from the sprawling oak branches, casting eerie shadows. My ears strained for any significant sounds over the echoing chorus of crickets, frogs, and the gentle whispers of the night breeze. The swamp was alive, but tranquility can sometimes be eerily unsettling. Something about the air felt different, but I brushed it off, reckoning it was just the quiet of the night playing tricks with my mind. I kept moving further along the swamp edge, the beam of the flashlight acting as my guide in the darkness. I took slow steps, staying vigilant and listening intensely. This was swampland after all. Any wrong step could take you knee deep into marsh or worse, bring you face to face with a gator. Halfway through my perimeter check, I noticed something that made me stop dead in my tracks. As the light hit the swamp's edge, I saw something that made my heart race. Suddenly, contrasted against the darkness of the bushes, I saw this large, moving shadow, darker than the night around it. The sight was unsettling, and something inside me screamed that this was no normal swamp critter. There was a rustle, a displacement of air, and then this low hum started emanating from the shadow, almost like a low frequency that you could feel in your chest more than you could hear with your ears. Pulling my gun out of the holster, I had to fight to keep my hands steady adrenaline preparing my body for a fight or flight response. Then, all of a sudden, the thing stepped out of the foliage. I saw what looked like a human body, but with disproportionately long limbs. It stood roughly five to six feet tall. I damn near had a heart attack right there and then. Worse still, the creature had these large bat-like wings that seemed to sprout from its back, like oversized umbrellas, almost the size of its body. It was as black as night and covered in what looked like feathers. Its head was very small compared to its body and lacked a face, except for two large, red, glowing eyes. Reality seemed to blur around the edges, and I could hardly believe what I was seeing. I took a step back, but stumbled over a root, landing hard on my back with a grunt. The flashlight slipped out of my hand, casting a spectral pattern onto the leaves overhead. Seeing me on the ground, the creature turned and with one swift motion uncoiled its wings and leapt into the sky. The force of its departure caused the trees around to shudder. I swear they lost leaves in its wake. I scrambled back to my feet. Filled with a mix of terror and astonishment, I backed away from the swamp, back to the safety of my patrol car, and I left without even telling the property owner. Back at the precinct, I recounted the night's episode. Of course, folks ribbed me, made jokes about me seeing swamp spirits, 
but I know what I saw. The swamp's filled with more than gators and snakes, that's for sure. And the old man. I heard that he moved out of his house a week later, sold the property, and got the hell away from the swamps. Can't say I blame him either. My nights patrolling near the swamp have been different. The silence feels heavier. The darkness somehow darker. The swamp is no longer just an ever-changing body of land, but now something that is masking the unknown and the unseen. Every hoot, every splash takes me back to that bewildering encounter. It didn't take long for word to spread in the small town, and soon, folks began whispering about the creature of Lafayette. A strange satisfaction washed over me that I wasn't the only one to have seen it. This happened only a few months ago. I work as a forest ranger in the heart of Olympic National Park in Washington State. I'm definitely one who will go for the serene call of the wild any day, so this was the perfect job for me, and I know the area pretty well here. So, when something out of the ordinary happens, you know I'll notice it. My days in the park usually start off the same way. I grab a breakfast of oatmeal and coffee, and then I'm off patrolling. The park is a magnificent place, so it doesn't even feel like a job most days. Now, in my 15 years here, I've encountered all sorts of wildlife. But what I saw that day, it's something that doesn't exactly fit into one of Mother Nature's brochures. I was carrying out a routine surveillance deep in the forest area. We'd been tracking an unusually large pack of coyotes for a while now. They were an anomaly in the area and were causing a bit of disruption. My job was to monitor their movements and try to keep the human-wildlife interactions to a minimum for the safety of everyone involved. I was tailing this old logging trail they'd used the previous night. Everything looked exactly as you'd expect. There were fresh paw marks, a few scraps of a recent kill. Looks like they had a couple of rabbits the night before. All normal stuff there. But as I ventured deeper, I started to notice something rather strange. The previously vibrant wildlife seemed to have gone into hiding. No bird calls. No sounds of squirrels scrambling up and down the trees. Even the rustle of the leaves, it all just ceased. I know you're thinking that well. Maybe it was just a quiet day. But trust me, something felt wrong. Let's just say, when you've spent enough time in the woods, you develop a gut feeling about these things. As I inched forward, it gradually started to get harder to breathe. A stench started to permeate the air, like a rotting carcass. But there was something more to it. Something I couldn't quite place. I've smelled a lot of things in the woods, including the aftermath of a bear kill. But this odor was odd. It almost had me gagging. I thought I'd caught the trail leading to the source of the wretched smell, and was about to begin following it when a strange sound caught me off guard. I wasn't quite sure what it was at first, but then I realized it was a growl. There was something out here with me, and from the sounds of it, it didn't want me there. I started to back away slowly. I didn't want to turn and run in case it triggered this creature's instinct to chase me. I didn't know what it was then, but I wasn't about to take a gamble that I could outrun it. I was almost back to my truck and about to breathe a sigh of relief when I saw it. It had followed me out and I hadn't heard it trailing me at all. Not for a moment. The creature somehow managed to move silently through the forest without me noticing. That alone almost scared me more than the creature I saw standing before me. And that's saying a lot, because what I was looking at was something so unbelievably terrifying that it belongs in someone's nightmares. It stood on two legs, just like a man, but at an impossible height of seven feet or more. It was covered in dark, wet-looking hair, like it had some layer of slime of grease on its body. It had a broad chest and wide shoulders. I could make out a massive mane draped around its neck, reminiscent of a cape. Even putting the nauseating stench aside, it was downright demonic looking. It had a terrifyingly long snout, and I could have sworn it had a double row of teeth that almost glowed in the low light. It was like some grotesque Frankenstein-like mixture of a man and a wolf. It saw me looking at it, and it dropped down to four legs. And somehow, in that position, it was even more terrifying. One bounding leap and it would be on top of me. I knew that much. Our eyes locked. I drew my sidearm, not taking my eyes off the creature. The tension was palpable between us. 
As it stared back at me, I managed to hold back my fear. I had my gun held steady on it, and then, just like that, it turned and disappeared into the brush. It was as if the creature knew the gun made us equals and decided not to pursue me. But how could an animal know that? Whatever this thing was, it was far too intelligent for its own good. For a few moments, I stood rooted to the spot, staring at the place where the creature had vanished. I didn't know what to think. That night, back in my cabin, the woods didn't seem so familiar anymore. I questioned every rustling leaf, every distant howl, wondering if there were any more of those creatures out there. Now you may think I'm off my rocker, or it was a trick of the low light, but I assure you, I know what I saw. My world was turned sideways for a bit, and I revisited that site almost every day since, looking for more traces of that creature. I think at this point I've just accepted that it lives out there. I don't like to think about it too much anymore beyond that. Sometimes strange things happen in the most mundane situations. I'm a plumber by trade, but also an avid outdoorsman. This strange episode of mine happened last summer. I had taken a week off from the usual leaks and clogs of life to travel out west a bit. I decided to visit Bryce Canyon National Park. I'd heard a lot about it, but had never been there before. The moment I got there, I was entranced by those red rock formations and surreal alien landscapes. I was ready for some refreshing outdoor adventures, but it seems fate had another thing in mind for me that day. I decided to hike on the Navajo Loop and Queen's Garden Trail when I got there. It was argued to be one of the best ways to see Bryce. It supposedly featured a tour of the more dramatic hoodoos, the passages through the canyon walls, and the natural amphitheater that truly brings out the magic hidden within the canyon. Plus, there was a place named Wall Street, and that one made me chuckle a bit, just the kind of humor Mother Nature has. That's where things got a little strange. As I descended into Wall Street, the rays of the sun weren't as unforgiving. Towering rocks shielded me and made the air cooler. The echo of my footsteps just bounced off the walls. The tall, narrow walls of the canyon created a sort of eerie ambience. It felt like being on a totally different planet. And then, out of nowhere, I heard a low, growl-like sound resonating off the stone walls. It sounded like it could have been a ways off, but the echo made it tough to tell. My first thought was, great, I'm about to meet a bear. I paused and surveyed my surroundings, seeing nothing but the towering rocks and the shadows they cast on the canyon floor. Moisture clung to the cool walls of the gorge, and a smell started to permeate the air. I can only liken it to the scent of damp fur, a rather pungent odor like a wet dog that's been out in a swamp all day, a smell that felt out of place within the arid, sun-soaked formations of Bryce. I dismissed it as the musk of some local wildlife, and that was that, or so I thought. As the day moved on, the shadows in the DCA areas of the trail started getting longer. I brushed off my unease as a mere psychological trick nature was playing on me. And yet, I couldn't shake the sensation I had of being watched, even followed. But being an avid hiker, I knew Mother Nature was not all majestic views and peaceful environments. That smell of wet fur and rotting garbage grew even stronger. It seemed to follow me along my path, and that eerie feeling of being watched just wouldn't go away either. The hair at the back of my neck pricked up harder than before, and the strange growling, now a weird combination of low grunts and occasional whooping noises, continued echoing through the canyon. I knew something was wrong, but where was I supposed to go? I couldn't pinpoint the location of the vocalizations. I could either keep moving forward or go back. I chose to keep walking. Not a moment later, I saw movement further up the trail. Swiveling around, I squinted my eyes over the path. The dense shadow of the towering hoodoos made it almost impossible to discern anything. Against my better judgment, I decided to follow the creature. As I stepped gingerly over the rocky path, my heart pounded in my chest. Suddenly, a large form materialized from the shadowy depths of the canyon. When I say large, I mean huge, at least nine or ten feet tall. It was covered from head to toe in thick, shaggy hair. The hair was an odd mix of reddish and light brown, almost making the creature blend right in with the background. 
I know how this is going to sound, but the creature was literally some sort of bipedal ape. It moved with surprising grace, despite its hulking body. In shock, I let out an involuntary gasp, my flashlight's beam trembling before it landed on its face. The light revealed an uncannily human-like face. Its head was somewhat cone-shaped with a sturdy brow ridge. A pair of beady black eyes glared back at me. The face itself was fascinating. At least to me, it had an almost primitive Neanderthal look to it. It was like I was looking at some missing link in the evolution of man. I stood there frozen, watching the creature watch me. Then, it suddenly let out a loud, yelping growl. I swear I'd never heard anything like that before. I guess it could have been fear or nerves or both, but I had the sudden instinct to turn tail and run. Judging by the creature's noises, I don't think it wanted me there. So I did just that. I ran. I sprinted as fast as I could all the way back to the parking lot. Finally reaching my car, I slammed the door shut and took off. The next day, I returned to the trail, half expecting it to have been nothing more than a nightmarish figment of my imagination. But when I saw the disturbed foliage and now dried, large, unrecognizable footprints imprinted in the damp earth of yesterday's trail, I knew better. Call it what you will. Sasquatch, Bigfoot, or perhaps some unidentified species of desert ape. Whatever its true identity, I know now that there are mysteries in the wilderness that we might not ever find answers to. I was always skeptical of these types of tall tales until it happened to me. Whether you believe me or not, you better be prepared for anything if you set food into the wild. It's their territory, not ours, and we do best to remember that. Living on the outskirts of Anchorage definitely has its quirks. There are some odd folks up here, and that's not the least of it. This particular series of events happened a few winters back. Now. I don't live up there anymore, but back then, I found myself out in the sticks looking into something a bit off-kilter. I had a little cabin out in the middle of nowhere that operated mostly off-grid. The seclusion was pretty enticing to me, but the job opportunities weren't very plentiful. I found myself working as a general handyman for the people in the community. I had a bit of experience working in plumbing and electrical, no formal schooling or anything like that, just on-the-job training. It wasn't much, but it was good enough to get the job done. Life as a tradesman can lead you down some strange roads and into some even stranger homes. Now don't get me wrong, most days were pretty typical. You've got leaky faucets, clogged toilets, dripping showers, the usual stuff. But every once in a while you find yourself in a sticky situation. On this particular day, I was called to investigate an unknown disturbance. Not my usual gig, but I needed the work. I'd been hearing vague stories from the people around town. Nothing concrete, but they were talking about weird noises that couldn't be explained and sudden, off-putting smells. Just bizarre happenings in the area just outside of town. I arrived at the house and nothing appeared out of place, but there was an uncanny silence in the air. I don't remember hearing any bird song, squirrel chatter, or even the wind blowing through the barren trees. There was just nothing. It's not like we were in a bustling city by any means, but the forest usually has some noise to it. Of course, winter made everything a bit quieter, but still, it shouldn't have been that quiet. I began making my way around the property, noting any signs or clues of strange goings on. There were strange marks in the underbrush, like something had been plowing through the foliage. Whatever it was, it must have been big. It was too late in the season to be a bear, Maybe a moose? I saw some disturbances in the snow. It was odd to say the least. If you've ever been around horses, you'll know they like to roll in the dirt and in the snow. The area was padded down and marked up just like that. Like a horse, or something the size of a horse, had been rolling there. Again, I figured it was a moose. I'd never seen moose roll in the snow like that, but I suppose they could have. I examined the area for tracks. The creature that had been here must have left footprints behind. The tracks were deep in the snow and hard to identify, but they looked canine in nature. A wolf, perhaps? That didn't make sense at all. The creature laying here in the snow was, at minimum, 
the size of a grown horse. It couldn't be a wolf. Out of nowhere, I heard something in the forest behind me. It sounded like some sort of growling animal. Maybe it was a wolf. And then I was hit by the smell. It was like a mix of wet dog and something rotten. Like old garbage. I can still remember the raw stink of it. It was utterly gut-churning. Whatever I was investigating, this was definitely the thing I had been hearing about around town. Something was off. I knew that much. I didn't know what I was walking into or what I would find. But I knew, deep in the pit of my stomach, that this was not going to be an ordinary job. Little did I know just how far from ordinary it would turn out to be. I heard something moving again behind me. I hit the ground instinctively, hiding behind the closest tree. My pulse was deafening in the silence as I dared to take a peek. There was something there, just beyond the edge of the wood. It was something big. That's all I could tell from my current vantage point. I crawled along the ground to find cover in another grove of trees, where I could get a better look at the unknown beast. As I looked closer, I could make out a large silhouette standing upright. I could see the dim outline of its form against the snow-covered backdrop. It was about seven to nine feet tall and stood up like a man. But it wasn't a man. It had massive wide shoulders and appeared to have a humped back. It looked like something out of a horror flick. The head almost looked hyena-like, with pointy ears and a long snout. It was definitely canine, but it didn't have the long, tapered snout of a wolf. It was almost like that of a bear, a bear mixed with a wolf. Before I could think about it too much, the creature let out a low growl, primal and guttural. I've never heard anything like it before. Whatever this thing was, it was way above my pay grade. All I wanted to do was get out of there. I managed to back away slowly, hoping the creature wouldn't notice me. I knew running might trigger a chase, and I was certain I wouldn't be able to outrun that thing. Ever so carefully, I silently put one foot behind the other never taking my eyes off the creature. It felt like ages before I finally got far enough away to slip into a full sprint back to my truck. I never looked back, never paused. I just ran. Even in the safety of my vehicle, I struggled to make sense of the encounter. Maybe I had been out in the cold for too long, or my mind was playing tricks. But I couldn't deny what I saw or the fear that had gripped me. Later on, as I sat in my living room trying to process everything, I found myself unable to shake off the chill from the encounter. I reached for my phone, scrolling through possible wildlife around the Anchorage area. Wolves, bears, even Bigfoot. None of the creatures matched my encounter. What the hell was that out there? Was it something known? I even flirted with the idea that it was someone in a costume scaring people off the land, or perhaps an undiscovered creature. Nothing made sense. For a while I thought I was going crazy. But then, what about all those other people who had seen the creature, heard it in the forest at night, and smelled that stench of rotten dog alone in the woods? What about them? Were they all crazy too? Or perhaps there is something else out there, more terrifying than any of us want to admit.